space, of course, you need a some sort of timer. Like legend has it that Galileo tried to measure the speed of light by you know opening and closing a lamp with a shutter. Um, I didn't think that was very successful, um, but. Uh, fortunately, we have a better timer than that. Um, so the timer that we have uh, is uh, quant a quantum effect, which I'll explain later. But the idea is we have a light beam that's going to travel a particular distance, first as a planar wave front, and then later on we'll compare that with the wave front that's the Bessel wave fronts. And we are going to show that this second case has a slower speed. So the you might be uh, realizing now the slowing down that I'm talking about is actually very geometrical. It's not a quantum effect at all. But the tool that we use to show this delay is a quantum mechanical effect. And that's just because that was our expertise when in, in Glasgow, um, we do quantum experiments. It just so happened that within that toolbox, we were able to find something which we could use to measure this delay. And that delay, um, we measured using the hong u mandel interference, um, which is, uh, I'm going to discuss it later. So we measure the delay using the hong u mandel which is a very central interference phenomenon uh, with uh, single photons. So hong u mandel is what you have when you have two identical photons interfering in a beam splitter. So this is a beam splitter with input ports A and B, output ports A and B here on the other side. And when you have two photons which are indistinguishable, meaning there's no property that could make me identify either of these photons, what happens is a very nice quantum effect, the hong u mandel effect. Like these photons will, um, so these photons, if I put detectors there, and they are indistinguishable, they will bunch, meaning these this, the contributions from when the two photons separate at the beam splitter will disappear. And what I have is this nice uh, bunching of photons where the two photons just go to the same detector. And this was, um, this was shown experimentally in the 1980s by Hong Wu and Mandel, where they did exactly this, the, the same thing. They have photons impinging on a beam splitter. They have detectors on the output boards, and they looked at the coincidences, meaning the, num the, the number of times where you will have the two photons uh, clicking on either detector, so meaning they separated. Um, so those, those are the coincidences. So what they what they found was there is some delay. So they were they have a controllable delay. So in a way, it was the property that distinguishes the the photon S and photon I. So they found that there is a particular delay where the coincidences drop to zero, meaning the photons were not separating. They were just all going to either this detector or this detector. So the coincidences drop to zero. And that is what we often call the hong u mandel dip. And it's a very precise point as you scan this uh, controllable delay here. So this is the, I guess, the key ingredient that led, that uh, helped us um, measure the delay because there was this quantum effect based on the hong u mandel interference. So the position of the dip now, this can act as, a, as our timer because this dip will coincide to the, to the case where the photons arrived at the same time, like this, because I, I couldn't distinguish these photons. So it's, it's, our, it's our marker for, for, for the timer. So trivia um, work actually, the home, the Hong Wu Mandel experiment came out in 1987 in BRL, but actually I think 
even earlier, Loudon already um, proposed this interference effect in this optics communications paper here. So I encourage you when you talk about the Hobo Mandel effect, reference this one as well, because this might actually have come earlier too, or about the same time at least. Anyway, okay. So going back to so let's leave Homo Mandel for a while. Let's go. Let's go to speed again. So when we talk about single photons, at what speed do they travel? Um, so as we discussed earlier, I said earlier, you have the phase velocity and you have the group velocity. Um, when you're putting a detector in that beam after that beam splitter, at what speed is that photon actually traveling? Um, so this was another key experiment that helped us solve this, uh, solve, uh, solve our problem. Because Quiat and Ephraim Steinberg um, already did a Hong Umandel experiment, which showed that the speed at which um, single photons travel is actually the group velocity. Um, so what they did in their experiment was, this is your Hong Umandel experiment without anything in the beam path of these two photons. So they did that experiment. They found that the dip is here. And then they did another experiment where they put glass on the path of one of the photons. So let's think about it for a second. If the photon here will travel slower, we expect that the Hong U Mandel dip will come at a point which is to the right of your reference delay. So in this case, what they found was there was a delay of 35,000 femtosecond, which um, which is you know in, in which is consistent with your expectation. It should be delayed because there is a glass bit there. But the question is what is the speed? So they calculated different expectations for that delay based on the phase velocity and the group velocity. And they found that it's actually a uh, group velocity. The experimental results agree with the group velocity. So they've established that single photons detected with your single photon detectors, they travel with uh, the uh, group velocity. So now that gave us a a recipe for testing for for showing that a photon that has a particular shape actually travels slower than a photon which doesn't have any shape. Um, so in our experiment, what we will do is we will have a Homo Mandel experiment. First, we'll establish a reference position where both photons are just are plane waves, and then. We'll compare that with an experiment, a Homo Mandel experiment, where one of the photons now has a vessel beam shape, and we are going to look at the dip of the Homo Mandel, whether that will be to the right or to the left of this reference position here. And by how much this dip has been displaced, we could calculate by how much the group velocity has uh, slowed down. OK, so I'll have another aside now because this is another important component of our experiment. So we talk about single photons and giving them shape, but we also need to be able to measure those shapes. So we need a way to measure shape in the same way you measure a polar polarization with a polarizer. And that is available to us. Um, in in the form of these um, holograms here. So what these are are these are like in 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 the 90s. What you would have is you develop a film which has this forked feature here, and if you have a beam that's impinging on this uh, fork, you'll get a beam that's shaped like a donut. And if you examine the wave fronts, it will be like these twisted wave fronts here. So this is a standard way of uh, making uh, Laguerre Gaussian beams. Um, and so you have a way to create this. Um, but if you just reverse that, because optics is reversible, you could imagine the hologram that you use to generate these beams 
you could also use them to detect these shaped beams. Because what you have is you have your shape beam, for example, here a Laguerre Gaussian beam. I will well, make the reflect, uh, it, it will impinge on this hologram and it would transform that shaped beam into a Gaussian mode that you could now couple into a single mode fiber. So it's completely the reverse of this process here. And that has been exploited in this uh, very important paper here by Zeilinger and company in 2001, when they showed that uh, photons produced from um, down conversion, so you have a nonlinear process here, which just creates your two, your photon pair. Um, they showed the entanglement, the quantum correlations of these photons using the, this exact, uh, this exact uh, holograms. So what you have here is now the analog to the polarizer, um, except that they are harder to align. <laughs> but we have we have a way to measure photon shape. And this actually has been uh, also used to um, do quantum state tomography to to this to like find the mathematical description, the density matrix of your photons from down conversion. Um, I believe this is the this is the first sorry this is the first uh, first paper which did quantum state tomography on single photons using the same kind of technology, the holograms. Now, what I did for my PhD and a lot of my work, you know, coming before coming to Australia was um, these uh, encoding and measuring photons and their shape using holograms. But instead of having the film, we have a programmable device called a spatial light modulator. And it's really nothing but a screen that's like your, you know, liquid crystal display. Um, we have an array of liquid crystals that you uh, that sits on a voltage plate and by changing the voltage I could tilt those liquid crystals and therefore I could shape the wave front of the light that's going to reflect from that device. So there's a very convenient way to measure um, the shape of, uh, of photons. And we did a lot of work on single photons and their shape. We've shown that it's a very it's a it's a quantum property. You could do quantum information with it. Um, there's a lot of other papers, but I think we've established now it's uh, the single photons and shapes. It's a uh, it's uh, it can be used to show quantum phenomenon, and that's important because that's what we need for our Hong Wu Mandel experiment. Okay. So now I'm going to describe the experiment itself. So I think we now have all the ingredients we need to understand uh, the experiment that we did. So the first, first ingredient is we need time correlated photons, meaning we need photons that were born at the same time in our, in our nonlinear crystal here. And these photons, we then separate into an idler path and a signal path. So the idler photon, as you could see here, it will travel unchanged onto the one input of the beam splitter. But the signal photon, we are going to send it to a path where its shape can be changed by the SLM. So we have here an SLM that would change its shape through this path here and then an SLM, which will project it back onto a fundamental, onto a Gaussian mode, so that then at this point, they will be indistinguishable. These two photons will be indistinguishable again, and we could observe Hong Umandel experiment, the Hong Umandel effect. So what we did was we measured the coincidences as a function for, uh, of each delay and as a function of the shape of the photons that we put here. So this is the result for the Bessel case. Um, so the dip position, so the black, the black line corresponds to the shape in the signal arm where it's just the best plane wave that we could make. So it's like a, it's a pl our plane wave. And as you could see, that's what we call the zero position here. It's our reference. The purple and blue, 
these are the cases where on the SLMs we sh we made a bezel a bezel beam a bezel shape, and as you could see, as we expected, the Hong Umandel curves are to the right of the reference here. So that means that when we change to the bezel beam, the there was a there was a delay, and that delay depends on the angle of our on this angle here on the angle of the bezel beam. And this delay, you could actually model it very, um, like very well with a very geometric, very geometric, uh, yeah, ge ge geometrically, because it's really just the the more the angle, the more the the delta is, the 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 longer it would take to traverse that distance. So as you could see, we tried different alphas, and we could fit very well with our expectation. OK, so the other uh, the other the other uh, experiment we did was because we thought, OK, bezel beam is a bit exotic, like you actually need uh, you need special lenses, you need an SLM to do it. Um, what if you just have a lens? If you just you just have the simple concept of focusing. So because as we I've, I've showed earlier, what you have in between after the lens, you've got those tilted wave fronts again. So you have your planar wave fronts before the lens, and then after you've got the spherical wave fronts. And in fact, this is uh, this is similar to what the bezel beam has. So if you compare the rays that are here and are here, this one would take longer because this one has a tilted uh, tilted wave front. Um, so that's actually one good measurement of the wave fronts in case uh, you're looking. Um, it's a very good very good experimental result from hell. Um, so this one we have uh, we have we did focusing where we examined the waves that are near the optical axis and the wave fronts that are farther from the optical axis. Um, so the we expect that the delay would be proportional again to how tilted the wave fronts you are measuring are. And that's something that you could relate to the F number. Um, so it's the, the bigger that number is, the waist with respect to the focal length, the bigger the delay we expect. So we showed this experimentally this way. So again, um, sorry. So we we made a, a reference. So reference meaning we just have the full aperture of the beam. We have a, the full aperture of the Gaussian beam when we when we focus it. So full aperture, sorry. Okay. Full aperture, the dip was at point A here. So we expect that when we are only measuring the photons which are nearer the optical axis, so you have a smaller angle. So we block the edges. We expect the delay would be to the left of this reference position, and indeed that's what we found. And when we looked at the photons, which are at the periphery of that beam, so here, so here you expect the wave, the wave direction, the wave vector is more tilted. We expect that delay would be to the right or of our reference position, and indeed that's what we found. So we could by selecting which photons interfere in that Hong Umandol experiment, we are able to change the position of the dip. And I thought that was actually a very, it's, it's, a, it's a very good result because it's, I mean, focusing light is something really common. Like we do it every time you take a picture. And to be able to say that, okay, I could focus light by, you know, taking, focusing it, I could slow down light by just focusing it. It's quite a powerful picture in my head. So yeah, it, I, I love this result. OK, so we've, I, I've only talked about really a geometrical interpretation of why the delay is in terms of tilted wave fronts of tilted rays. But we actually derived this rigorously. Well, not me, my <laughs> theorist collaborators. And we were able to show that indeed you could really get that delay by looking at the spread of the transverse wave vectors. And you could do that for both the cases of the bezel beam and for the focused, uh, focused Gaussian beam. So we thought that was really, really cool. OK, so to summarize, um, I've 
presented you an experiment where we've shown that if you give single photons a particular shape, if they have a finite transverse structure, they will travel at a speed less than C. And we could measure delays that are in the order of 10 microns within a one meter propagation distance. It's not much, but if you think about it, it's about 3,000 per second of slowing down, um, which is a big number, but you know, it's light, so it would still be fast. Um, the, the, the delay is really proportional to how inclined the plane wave components are, as you would expect. And it could be derived from both a simple geometric argument and from a rigorous treatment using wave propagation. It's not an anomaly at all. We could fully explain this. And it would be applicable to any wave theory, which you, you, know, you, you describe in, in this way. So when this uh, came out, there were a lot of questions like, what are the implications? And to be honest, I had so much fun doing the experiment. I didn't really think a lot about that. But uh, luckily, um, Roy Sambles uh, wrote a very good perspective piece for this work, um, Structured Potents Take It Slow. Um, it would be, it, it's a good read, like he was thinking about what does it mean in terms of galactic scale? like. Do we really have photons that don't have any transverse structure? Because obviously there's always appreciable transverse structure, especially at the beginning of the universe. Like, I don't know if anyone thought about that uh, seriously since. Um, but what I did just uh, now, because I knew I was going to present this seven year old paper, I thought I'd look at what other people have done. And one of the, I, I found two works that came up, uh, I, I found it interesting. Um, so one is, uh, as you could see, we use hong Umandel interferometry to measure very small delays. Um, so 10 microns at a distance of one meter. So some, um, my, actually, my collaborator since, so Daniele, has taken that further. Um, they've shown that with this kind of technique, this hong Umandel interferometry, you could measure attosecond resolution delays. Um, so all the all that hong Umandel curves that you get from the experiment, you could process that in such a way that you'll be able to tell attosecond resolution delays. Um, so order of nanometers, which is, I thought, really good for meteorology. And the other thing, other development I think that's actually interesting is as you, in our work, we only change the transverse shape. But of course, light has so many different properties. Um, you could change its spectrum as well. Um, so this work here, uh, they showed that by spatial temporal shaping, you could actually vary the group velocities um, yeah, to, a, to a bigger extent. Um, I think that's this. This is both theory and experiment. I think it's uh, very interesting as well. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there are questions. I couldn't see Should the chat, so uh, someone has to read the chat. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. and I could. Uh, Thank you very much for that lovely uh, presentation. So um, we've got plenty of time for questions. So um, yes. so uh, uh, just wondering if there's uh, if people want to put their hands up if they've got a question and um, or if uh, we can have a look at the chat if people are having trouble with the um, with the audio.